I'm here today <clears throat> because I love sound. I love to make sound, and I love to listen to sound. I'm especially curious about how musicians use their instruments and how the quality of those instruments affects their experience while playing. My name is Mike Murray, and I'm a luthier. I specialize in the repair, restoration, construction, and professional setup of the violin family. Becoming a luthier is a crazy experience. Once I got past the am I totally nuts phase, <laughs> which for me, it took like three years. Um, and you know, it didn't really help. Virtually everybody I talked to had super supportive views to share. Like, well, that's a dying industry. <laughs> <laughs> or let's see, another one was, what are you going to do with that when you're done? Or I think my favorite was, is there any money in it? I get it, right? I think I've heard them all, and I understand. The whole idea is totally romantic. The question I get asked now is how? How in the world do you become a luthier? Well, the process is intense, and as I've alluded to, the most difficult part for me, I think, was getting started. It was only after much hesitation, self-skepticism, and opposition to the idea of being a totally poor artist for the rest of my life that I heated my gut and I began school in September of 2012. I chose to attend the Violin Making School of America in Salt Lake City, Utah. I chose to attend there because of its rich history, renown, and quality of education, toted as one of the most prestigious instrument-making institutions in the world. It was started by Peter Preer in 1972, seven years after he started his shop in 1965 where he not only excelled in the repair, restoration, sale, and construction of instruments. My infatuation with instruments began as a young person. I took every chance I had to acquaint myself with a new instrument, attempting to apply the years of music education that I'd had. My problem was that I couldn't pick and stay with just one instrument. There were way too many sounds to play with. However, during this time, I did learn some important lessons. Lesson number one, nice instruments are easier to play. Number two, nice instruments, generally speaking, sound better. Lesson number three, nice instruments are expensive. <laughs> <clears throat> With some antique instruments fetching prices of more than $15 million, I thought, man, if I ever want a nice instrument, I'm going to have to make it myself. Thank goodness, no prior woodworking experience was required to attend the school. The curriculum is designed to develop and hone the ability of students, no matter their skill level. Practical and conceptual woodworking methodology is a constant topic, always with the goal in mind of improving the level of craftsmanship and quality in instrument making. On the first day of school, I was welcomed by a pile of wood on my newly assigned desk. I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea what I was getting into, and many times over the course of my education there, wanted to throw in the towel. Before I began, I thought, you know, it can't be that difficult. I'd grown up on a farm. I'd helped build various homes. I'd used power tools and regular tools most of my life. I thought it would be similar to building a birdhouse. <laughs> you know? Just one with strings. The format of instruction is one-on-one. -on -one. You start at the beginning, and you complete each step, there's lots of them, to the highest level of quality possible. Getting permission to move on, or often start again. 
Instructors are there to teach you very carefully about craftsmanship and quality, what that means and how it will affect the overall outcome of your instrument. Many lessons I scarcely understood then and continue to wrap my mind around now. One such lesson is that of joining violin plates. In the violin family, the top plate and the back plate most often are two pieces of wood joined together in the center. This task is completed using a tool known as a joiner plane. By sliding the edges of the wood against the blade, a smooth, flat surface is created. That join has to be so close and so smooth that there's no gapping between it. And that when you try to rub those edges together, it creates an enormous amount of friction. So much so that trying to rub them together is really, really difficult. Not an easy task. Skills learned during the curriculum are tested at the very end. Students have to take three months out of their life, and they build two instruments. One is fully finished and varnished, while the other is just prepared to be varnished. And they have to do this away from school, away from instruction. It's a massive, massive challenge to complete, especially while trying to maintain the high standards of quality. The violin is an incredibly complex tool, one that has changed a lot. In high-quality instruments, the standards, or the tolerances, are relatively tight concerning dimension, shape, size, and setup. These and other structural components have evolved over hundreds of years in response to the needs of players and composers making instruments louder, easier, and more ergonomic to play. Upon finishing my graduation work, I excitedly accepted the opportunity to work at the Preer & Sons Violin Shop. Working in that shop and being exposed to some of the highest quality and most rare antique instruments in the world has helped me to further understand the, I the idea behind design and the effort on behalf of luthiers that has gone into perfecting the violin. My first exposure into the world of high-quality goods was the violin making school. The concept, right, this idea that an object could be designed and then created to last for hundreds of years is a foreign concept today, or so it would seem. For example, how many of us are wearing moderately uncomfortable shoes that cost very little and soon enough will end up in a landfill? The shorts, the shirt, the piece of jewelry, the watch, the appliance, the car. I remember as a young person being introduced into the world of hyper-consumerism from the electronics that I purchased to the clothes that I wore. The cheaper the better and the shorter the duration of use seemed to be the norm. Imagine my surprise when entering the violin school. All of a sudden, I was expected to create a high-quality work of art that I hoped would last for centuries. Not as a stationary object either, but as a tool that musicians would use constantly. I've experienced the wisdom in this approach not only would it help us in creating a brighter future, but the utility that we experience when consuming products that are better suited for our needs increases. Products would last longer, cost less over time, and the materials used in production would decrease. Not to mention, our current trend of hyperconsumerism is not sustainable. It's not. What would happen if we relearned what high quality goods were and we consumed only those goods? It's an interesting idea, one that I've learned a little bit about 
in the violin world as well. How does this all translate to sound? Behind me, I have two instruments. One's of a higher quality, one's of a lower quality. But which one's the higher quality one? I'll let you decide. To help illustrate the difference, please welcome to the stage Hobe Salazar Fonseca. Ladies and gentlemen, quality matters. Thank you.